Hi everyone, Joe here from Always Connect. Welcome back uh, to the latest episode of Code and Create. Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, to those um, who are new to us, um, we host these webinars, we get experts in the industry to come on and, um, and talk about various topics um, within the technology as a whole. Um, and those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. I know we always see uh, a few familiar faces, so thanks again for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about micro front ends um, with a good friend of ours, Marco Sanfilippo Fritola. Um, Marco is software engineer at American Express, uh, a solutions architect, a speaker, and huge JavaScript advocate. So I'm going to pull Marco up on screen now. Hi, Hello, Marco. Thanks. How are you? Me. Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks so much for hosting me today. No worries. Thanks for joining us again. It's your second uh, virtual event with us. Um, yes, correct. Now, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, Marco, tell us a little bit about uh, your yourself and your background. Yeah, as you mentioned, I'm a software engineer at American Express, and uh, in I'm also a, a computer engineering instructor for uh, other topics like uh, uh, system security, networking, and design patterns. Uh, today, we are going to cover this topic of micro front ends with some alternatives. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, so, I guess you go a bit more detail in terms of what we're going to cover today in terms of the micro front ends. Yes, so micro front ends is uh, a new uh, design approach that is kind of emerging today where large companies have, let's say, a really huge front end and uh, um, they, they are struggling with, let's say, efficient delivery of the UI. So there is this new kind of pattern that allows them to deliver in an efficient way. Right. So, and because there are a lot of pros and cons, when you usually find articles or blog posts online, you don't find, let's say, the right answer to your challenges, to your problems. And this is where I want to focus. Like micro front ends is a really good alternative, but it's not the only one. Okay, so, cool. yeah, we will cover pros and cons of it. Excellent. So you've got a presentation um, that we're going to go through. Um, Marco's going to go through that. I think roughly about 30 minutes, roughly, the presentation, Marco? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, yes. I will try to share <laughs> mine. <laughs> yeah, cool. I'll, I'll chime in with a few questions um, here and there. But, uh, but yeah, so if you're watching on Crowdcast, guys, uh, join us. Um, join in on the chat bar, which I think is that side of me. Um, vote in the polls, which is down there. We've got a few polls going on. Also, get your questions in for Marco down there as well. Uh, you'll see the Ask a Question tab. Um, you can use that to uh, to get questions in. So after the presentation, um, any questions that we've got, we're going to put to Marco, and um, hopefully he can, he can give you some good insight on that. If you're on, if you're watching us on LinkedIn Live, give us a thumbs up. Um, pop any questions you've got in the comments. We'll be uh, keeping an eye on those as well. So. Um, Yes, so let's have a quick check of the polls, actually. I've, I'm, I've put these in there just out of curiosity, really. So first question, if you can see these, Marco, do you understand what micro front ends are? Almost 80% of people have said no, which is quite interesting. So hopefully today we can um, shed some light on that. <laughs> um, does your company currently, does your current company adopt micro front ends? Again, 85% of people know. Um, but are they worth it? Eighty percent of people have put hell yeah. So, um, yeah, interesting to see how that will. Uh, hopefully, by the end of that, we'll we'll shed some light on what micro front ends are, if they're beneficial, um, and are they beneficial to certain companies? I know you mentioned earlier that large companies it, it might benefit more, but hopefully we'll we'll get into that. So, um, so yeah, the floor's yours, Marco. Um, if you want to share your share your screen. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully there won't be no technical hiccups here like before. Here we go. That's perfect. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, thanks much, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Again, uh, my name is Marco. I'm a software engineer at American Express. Uh, but today, uh, most of the thoughts, let's say, are my own uh, from a perspective of uh, who has been involved in various development strategies at scale. So I'm going to talk about a series of topics related to front-end development. 
And uh, doing front-end development is not just UI development. There are many other things you want to consider. Uh, I, I noticed that, of course, today, tech blogging is very popular, but usually find um, very, uh, let's say, little about solutions to complex problems. And after, you know, chal the challenges you face, you're facing are not in a blog post. Uh, so we'll cover, let's say, maintainable development at scale, including but not limited to micro front ends. So this, for example, is uh, a poll that I shared in one of the various LinkedIn groups, just to <laughs> just to mention one. <laughs> and uh, that was a comment that uh, actually caught my my attention, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, micro front end is a buzzword. That's true. Uh, mm -hmm. But micro front end is not something true. Sorry, it's not something new. Um, there have been many talks and articles about it in the last two to three years, maybe not exactly with the world of micro front ends. And believe me, many more will follow. We don't know in general what companies around the world are doing for their own internal uh, architecture until they go public to either promote themselves or because uh, they think they can have an impact on the tech community. So I want to remind that companies change development strategy, not because of the blogging you see around, but because there is a need to deliver values in a different way. So blogging should inspire you, but you should not feel behind anyone. If the solution works for your company, and uh, maybe it's not a trending one, it's OK. Like, it doesn't mean you can't deliver values to your users. You are doing the right thing. Uh, of course, you can always challenge yourself by asking if you're doing it in the right way. So in development, let's say at early stage, any working product usually can be made up of three monolithic layers. You know, you have the data storage, you have the API layer and the UI. And when the complexity starts growing more and more, what you usually do is breaking them down in smaller uh, parts that are more easy to manage, let's say subdomains. And this is exactly where domain-driven design might come into the picture. Uh, there are many advantages and disadvantages as well in using a domain-driven approach. So be careful when, when you adopt it. Um, so let's say you work with domain experts to compartmentalize the areas so that you can get into a microservice-based solution. And uh, you know you can scale better, you can say manual infrastructure, and so on. But what about the front end? Like on top of a microservice architecture, you have a front end monolith growing inside. Insights, uh, let's say, is your single SPA application. And this can be, you know, very, very boring, right? Um, remember that we live in a real world where time is money. And uh, in, let's say, for example, you are in a startup, right? And you are often short in time and money. So there might be many cases at this point. Let's imagine you need to reuse. Uh, uh, UI part somewhere because, uh, for example, the various journeys are similar or you want to share some parts. And then um, processes, for example, might not be Marco, Sorry, uh, sorry yeah? to interrupt you there. It, can you hear that banging? Sorry? Can you hear the banging? I can hear like very loud banging. I don't know if that's my laptop or not. Uh, I don't know. Uh, give me a second in case I can I can check. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I just I, I couldn't hear what you're saying over the banging. That's all. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me turn my camera off for a sec. Can you do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. So while we're waiting, guys, don't forget to uh, get involved in the polls. Again, still going up. Um, also. Uh, yeah, I'm back. Again, get the questions in for Marco as well. Marco's back. I just yeah. heard him. Here yeah. we go. Uh, sorry. You're getting some build, building work done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you see still my screen share, right? Yeah, 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 cool. Okay, great. So I was saying, uh, sorry for the interruption. Let's imagine then you need to reuse uh, a UI part somewhere uh, because of uh, uh, the virus journey maybe can can reuse some some parts of 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 the UI, right? So, or you have some processes that are, that are not efficient. So you have a maintenance problem. For example, your build time takes a lot, or your release time is uh, kind of consuming, even for small changes. 
or for other reasons, for example, your tech stack, I mean, the tech stack that has been chosen uh, is, not, uh, is not okay anymore. So you need to migrate it or simply you need to upgrade the API of the framework, right? So one of the three can immediately prevent or sensibly slow down any sort of product delivery. So we are in trouble. Okay, so what happens now? You might start duplicating the code, which is okay, but there should be a reasonable limit to duplications because then you, you, you face another maintenance problem. That is, each change should be replicated in many places. And if not, it can result in a fragmented user experience. Um, so another natural reasoning is um, to extract everything in shared libraries. So abstracting is something exciting for us because eventually it can be a shared library, you know, one, uh, uh, or an open source library, but it can be also a short term solution. As I said, at some point you want to migrate, for example, the tech stack or uh, upgrade or switch framework, right? So as well, let's say from a real perspective, you still need to keep your service up and running because can be a source of revenue and you can't lose your customers, right? So we have tech debts, we have inexperience, we always find uh, better solutions. Uh, often we have fine, fun in rewriting code, but what we need to solve is a recurring problem of tech debts. So, okay, at this point, what we want to do is scale, like deliver the UI in a better way. And um, my, my, my front end, it's a kind of big monster and I want to break it down. Usually what you find is, okay, it might be a good time to adopt micro front ends. And this is wrong. Like this is not the time you should adopt micro front ends. This is the time you should learn from your past decisions and find something better. Of course, yes, micro front end is a kind of trending topic. There is a lot of hype. It's also a green field to gain popularity for tech riders, but we don't need to be part of the crowd because it's fancy. So we need to build a resilient software solution because we don't want to face any more, any high cost of maintenance over the time. So this is where I want to share my experience because micro front ends is Again, a great solution, but really there are costs. I was going to say, actually, Marco, sorry to interrupt, just to say, um, obviously, a lot of companies now are even migrating their, their tech stack or always up, upgrading it, at least. So I was going to say, is this is this the best time to, to start adopting micro front ends? But, but you're saying that's not necessarily the case. Exactly. It's not necessarily the case. We will see what are, let's say, pros and cons. Uh, yeah, yeah. for micro frontends and the alternatives. So I can anticipate that I'm involved daily with my job in a micro frontend development strategy, but this is not the only one I was involved in my career. And trust me, there are many other valuable alternatives that we will cover. So let's see what are micro frontends. So micro frontends is an architectural style. Often it is mentioned along with microservices. There are many ways to get into the world of microservices. As well, there are many ways to reach a micro frontend architecture. Um, you might want to use micro frontends, but maybe you don't need it, or maybe you're already using it and you don't know. So the word micro has been taken from microservices because all that is micro seems like is more easy to handle. So it's the same word, but I would like to remind that there are different root causes, different challenges, and different results. So let's say a popular way of presenting microservices, sorry, micro frontend solutions are, why can't the UI evolve naturally as the backend layer did with microservices? This parallelism is not really appropriate because as I said, the challenges are, are not the same. They right. look similar, but they're not the same. Um, so the problem is that the front end layer is big in the back end. You want to scale it in terms of availability in the front end. You want to do something different, right? You're still breaking down, but the outcome is different. So this should be the right way of looking at the front end, uh, for micro, sorry, for micro front ends, uh, like over the time, the front end layer grows and gets more difficult to maintain. So now we see the problem, 
right? Like humans have no capability to maintain the front end when it gets big and big, right? So this is the, the big debate around the topic. Are we solving a human problem or are we solving a technical problem? There are two schools of thoughts on this. Like micro front ends can solve organizational problems by bringing uh, tech benefits versus the opposite. Um, and reading through articles, I am mainly on the opposite, which means we are solving a tech problem that we reflect in organizational benefits. So you see now, right, it's not an availability problem that was the back end one. You're not going to build a solution uh, to scale the UI with the yeah. front end you're going to improve the way you can deliver the UI. And to do so, you need to change your software structure, not necessarily your company structure. But I guess that takes, like you mentioned earlier, like time and money that obviously some companies don't necessarily have. Exactly. Yeah, so, okay, what is a micro front end solution? Micro front ends is an architectural style where you have independently deliverable entities or front-end applications that are composed into a greater whole. So basically with micro front-ends, the application is split into smaller and simpler chunks that can be developed, tested, and deployed independently. These are the three main things we want to achieve. So we need to give a better definition of chunks, right? So uh, is a set of uh, uh, smaller piece of code that have no coupling or, depend or dependencies between them, ideally. So basically what we want to do is break the front end down for development and then recompose it back for the user. Because of course you want to serve your customers with a web page that is the user interface. And this is where the solution becomes interesting. Um, it's also different from the backend problem because in the backend, you can have different strategies, different frameworks, different tools and uh, the backend is not user facing, right? So you can afford the tech inconsistencies. And this is not the same for the UI. This is why the solution in micro front ends is really interesting. Also, we need to consider many more points like performances and, and so on. We will cover all of them. But is the concept the same as sort of backend? I appreciate that there's different problems, um, like you mentioned earlier different solutions, but is the concept of it the same in terms of microservices, micro front end? Uh, not exactly. So there are many ways to reach a micro front end architecture and uh, you can deploy entities in a separate way and then you merge them together or um, you can have, let's say, the de during the development phase, you can have after you develop the small part of the application, you can bundle them together at yeah. compile time. So really, I see the problem, I see it as a different problem when compared to the microservice one. Because with microservice, we want to break things down, right? With micro front ends, we want to do the same. But we want to do it because we have a development, pro development problem, like developers, can't handle a monolith, right? Because it's uh, it's hard for the build time, for releases and so on. In um, the problem for microservices is different because in microservices, there was a scaling problem, right? So, okay, what happened in the past was that companies had a bunch of servers and uh, in those servers, apps were running. If you wanted to scale apps, you had to buy more servers, uh, which means more money. Yeah. Often not everyone has money, right? So this is why virtualization came into the picture to make sure that every time you want to scale, you don't buy a new server, mm. right? Because those servers were often under underused, which means um, money was wasted, right? Yeah, so that, that, that was the problem. This is the main difference. It's not a problem. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I actually read Martin Fowler's um, blog post, um, I think end of last week uh, that you mentioned there. I've put a link to it in the in the chat bar there on Crowdcast if anyone's interested, but it's a really good blog actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Absolutely. Um, 
Okay, so as I was saying, we want to deliver the UI in a different way, starting from development time, which means, okay, that we break things down and then we need to recompose them. Um, so a micro front end approach to the end user will be like a regular website, but under the hood, it might be built as a composition of separate micro entities. And um, in terms of splitting, it is about how it can solve the problem for you. So you should identify what is risky for you, what can be a blocker for you in terms of delivery, what is preventing you to go live, let's say, in a timely manner fashion. Um, so you should identify it, break it down, and somehow work just on it, like on a small part of the page. The rest can wait if there is nothing wrong with it. Let's say, I don't think you should split everything when you adopt and if you adopt a micro front end solution. Okay, so we broke the front end down in smaller entities and each new entity might live in its own repository, which means you can, I mean, micro front ends can also help in uh, uh, structuring the code base in a better way, especially when we talk about very large front ends. And each new entity can have its own pipeline to push this code through from environment to environment. So you have smaller products, they are easier to understand. You can work on a um, focused part, you can refactor it in a more incremental way than was previously possible when you had the giant uh, SPA application. If the solution that you choose allows it, you can also upgrade uh, uh, each part independently. Of course, this also allows team to release when they need to uh, without needs to coordinate with other teams or fit into a company-wide trend releases, right? Uh, so there is, there is a boost in productivity if you adopt micro front ends, because ideally teams, teams should not, let's say, um, be worried about affecting each other because you're not deploying everything, you're just deploying a part of the application, yeah. right? So you have more decoupled, autonomous teams, each one responsible for a product end-to-end, -end, which means also less communication and potentially more speed. Yeah. It doesn't mean, of course, there is no communication anymore, right? The, uh, they should be uh, able to operate and evolve independently where possible. Uh, so these are the benefits in terms of more scalable organizations. Uh, I hope you see it now, like you are solving a tech problem which reflects in uh, uh, orga with organizational benefits. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, how do we recreate the, the experience or the pages because we broke everything down, right? So we talk about front-end integration. Uh, that is, let's say, a set of techniques. Uh, on that especially, there is a lot in terms of uh, uh, blogging. So I will just go um, like high level overview to give some context and then we go on some points that I want to focus more. So when we talk about front end integration, one of the three things is uh, the composition. So we broke entities down and uh, now we need to do two things procure those entities and then compose the UI with such entities, right? That's because we say that we have independently deliver deliverable entities. So they might live in their own bundle somewhere in your infrastructure and there is the need to fetch them, right? And then you, you need to compose them. So the availability uh, can be mixed, can be static, which means a bundle time or can be fetched at runtime from the client uh or some can be server side rendered uh so again um it's also a compromise between flexibility and uh, uh cost of your infrastructure because if you do for example everything server side rendered because you want to have high seo then don't forget that in very large companies where you have billions of requests a day every request goes to your server to your infrastructure and this can be expensive so you need to balance you need to find a solution where you can keep let's say costs low and uh, performances high it's where you need to render just some some entities in terms of server-side rendering and the rest can be fetched for example at runtime or from from the client itself 
uh, communication, right? We say that we want to split those entities that are independent of each other. So why do we need those entities to communicate together, right? When I say communication, mainly is, uh, you can rephrase it with synchronization. Synchronization because you have, you started with a single, with a single user experience, right? You broke it down in multiple parts and you still want to make sure that everything works well uh, and is consistent during user interactions. In general, the recommendation is having those entities communicating as little as possible, or you might reintroduce the coupling that we were trying to avoid, right? And of course, you don't want to change from the strategy every year, but somehow, again, those entities should be uh, in sync. So here there is another compromise between breaking things down and recompose them together to back, to, to have back the, the same or equivalent user experience result. Of course, there are many solutions to this. I'm not going through through them. Uh, don't mix it because you know it's not recommended at all. And um, last but not least, something that we learned at SPA time, page routing. Of course, we started, I mean, there was a migration from classic routing to SPA because of you know, a lot of reasons. Uh, hard routing doesn't break just the user experience because of the page refresh. But if you consider this as well in a micro front end solutions, it can be even worse because the browser needs to download again and again many assets and this can impact your infrastructure. There is more code in a solution like this. So there is more code that needs to be downloaded and they can overload as well your, your user device. Think about mobile, for example. As well, if you adopt uh, SPA1, which of course has many benefits, you don't want to centralize things, the routing. So you need to go for a solution that can help in scaling the routing itself, maybe in a distributed manner. So, okay, having saying that really high level, there is a need for a shell application that is the, let's say the orchestrator of, of, of your experience. It doesn't mean that necessarily there is a single responsible entity for all the three things that we just have seen. Uh, there are many solutions, you can build your own. I just would like to uh, show uh, and mention actually three of the most valuable that I've found uh, for micro front ends. Uh, I don't think we have dedicated time for to go through all of them in detail. So I will just mention them. One is single SPA. Uh, the second technique is uh, module federation coming with Webpack 5. And the third one is one up with Holocron. So single SPA is a framework for bringing together multiple micro front ends in a, let's say in a front end application. So I see it more for small to mid-sized applications. If you really want to get into a micro front end solution in an application of a such size, I don't think it's a great idea because once it grows and grows more and more, I think you would build a framework around the framework because of your needs. So if you want to start, it's a good start, but I don't think you should go for a micro front end approach in a small to mid sized app. Why I mentioned module federation? Because uh, it's a great, um, let's say feature coming with Webpack 5. It's basically a mechanism where you can declare some entities as provided by a bundle. And if another bundle, uh, let's say Webpack bundle requires it, it can be fetched at runtime if it's not already present in memory, which means you can uh, it can be served in your application. Uh, it works uh, well with SSR. There are many other concepts and things that can solve. I really encourage you to explore Module Federation. It's a very young API. Uh, you would see many talks and blog posts around it, but trust me, it's a great strategy for reusability. We just had a question actually from Jamie. Yeah. Um, asking about Webpack 5. I think it was just before the, the slide come up actually. So I think that question has just been deleted, but um, but yeah, so it's basically just asking if you've got an experience using it, but it sounds like that would be, is it fair to say your preferred choice, Marco? Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, the last one, one up, I, um, 
is the most exhaustive solution that as of today is available for apps at scale in terms of micro front ends. It has been used by American Express in production since 2016, and you can find it as an open source. I use it in my daily job. I would continue to use it even outside of my daily job. It's very flexible, it's very powerful, it's high performance and uh, a complete solution. So one app, let's say with Holocron, why? Because Holocron is the truly enabler that, um, I mean, for the composition concept that we just discussed. So what happens is you develop modules and then those modules are the entities that I mentioned. And Holocron makes sure you can fetch those modules. So one app is the orchestrator and then modules is what you develop. I really encourage you to explore one app. It's uh, very, very powerful. I hope this answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, like, like I said, he, he actually deleted the, uh, the question because you spoke about it anyway. But um, I was just commented actually on the chat bar on the side. I'm not too sure if you can see that, Marco, because you're sharing the screen. But Jamie's put um, a little heart eyes emoji with uh, Webpack 5 Module Federation. <laughs> yeah, I will put later just because I'm sharing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's time to uncover micro frontends, really. Uh, as I said, micro frontends is something really great, uh, but it's a good fit just in very few cases. And uh, I mean, opposite to what is well advertised, is it is pictured as the solution for your company to scale. But be careful, I don't think it's the solution to scale. It might be one, let's say, across many different solutions you can adopt. In my opinion, again, my personal opinion, I would say in a set of cases, uh, micro front -end adoption doesn't go over 10%. And there could be many problems with it. So real quick, we, we went from uh, a single entity that was the web page to multiple entities that will compose the page. Something that we neglect is that many entities means we broke down the problem, now it's gone. I think we are creating potentially more problems, many more problems. The first is duplications of actions. What you were doing in a single page, now you can do in multiple entities. So, for example, you can easily fall in the trap of overloading backend resources because of many API calls, especially for those data-driven experiences. So previously you had, for example, a single page with just a few API calls. Now each entity might need just a small portion of the data. Mm -hmm. So you fire an API call for it. This is very dangerous because if you are, again, in a large organization, you can't afford to have like billions of requests more like as an addition because you can't overload your infrastructure as well you can't overload let's say the client especially if it's a thin client right think always about the mobile for example you can think to abstract the calls in a data layer for the front end like a container that can feed all the small entities but really if and when there are complex conditions, it means that you are centralizing everything back again, right? So you are going, you are reverting all the effort spent. There are some tools that can help, for example, with global caching, uh, in, if, the, if let's say many entities needs the same data, but of course it doesn't cover all the cases so you're not safe anyway and of course there are you know many other things like accessibility seo that we usually say oh i'll do my best and in case i will rely on another team that can set the guideline for me right so you should be careful on, on those things i think we have also problems on seo and accessibility in the web development in general regardless of micro front ends but especially with micro front ends we need to to make sure that we uh, we follow best practices. And also CI CD strategy, like especially at scale, you need a strong CI CD strategy to automate as much as possible. Otherwise it will be time consuming, not for development anymore, but for, for other things. Like, so is your company ready to handle that? We will cover uh, those points. There are also some irrefutable facts, let's say. 
Um, another commonly advertised benefit of the micro front ends is that you can have the vertical slicing of teams, which means each team is uh, owner in uh, everything in its domain. So UI, microservices, persistence, tooling, and so on. So they can upgrade and switch framework or solution whenever they need. So this is not really how it works in enterprises because you might face more costs than benefits. Autonomy can be positive, of course, but you don't want a fragmented company either. It's not a cost effective, it's not productive when each team builds its own solution. So it is not about just facing tech challenges like maintenance problems, but think about a wrong data model that maybe needs to be migrated and normalized. Think about lack of support. Think about how many hacky solutions, for example, a large organization with thousand front-end teams can, can have. It will result somehow in poor development experience and user experience, of course. So at scale, with risky products, you still have trend releases, joint workflows, boundaries already in place, maybe centralized sub-organizations that takes decision for you. Um, otherwise, I think it will be just a path to disaster. Like, think about, again, performances, maintenance, and, and user experience, pretty much everything that is important from a development perspective, right? So. I think it's a compromise between flexibility and efficiency. Ideal case would be having dedicated front-end team and back-end team only on the product and leave the enterprise architecture and let's say system security and other things to horizontal teams and make sure those horizontal teams can drive you. Uh, I mean, it's amazing that front end, I mean, micro front ends can enable independent deliver, delivery. But mm -hmm. what if connections arise over the time between those entities? Because if that's the case, your releases are not independent anymore. Yeah. You need to coordinate again, and the risk of breaking parts increases too. So you can opt in, for example, and use feature flags, but you don't need micro front ends to use feature flags, right? Uh, you can turn on and off easily parts of the application, but still it's not micro front ends that is solving the problem. So having full independent teams is not often feasible, especially when products start growing in number and connections. Uh, and when there are a lot of shared parts, uh, what happens is uh, that of course there was unenforced splitting, which was wrong, but as well, um, I mean, your team is not able to deliver anymore, as you were expecting. So micro front ends don't offer much for interconnected teams and domains, uh, especially where the work might not split equally between the different line of lines of business. Uh, it's unrealistic, and I would say also opinionated, to think that with domain-driven design, you can split everything. Mm -hmm. Because a wrong slicing of this I mean, we already experienced it, right? For example, with microservices, uh, you know, there is the ping pong effect where services are talking each other before responding to the user. This is this is something equivalent, right? Yeah, so it can have a knock-on effect to like the back-end teams, the design teams. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, as I said, it's not it's not true, it's not realistic that a team can own end-to-end -end everything. Again, in my opinion, you should go. You should focus only on front end and back end for the product, and then yeah. leave the enterprise architecture to other teams. Okay, testing is important. Testing is more important than the development itself. We neglect it as well. Don't forget that hundred percent coverage should be scaring you. You should not celebrate it. I mentioned that there are smaller entities, so you can focus only on the functionality of the entity. Right, But what about the integration of those? Who is responsible to provide an evidence that at runtime, nothing breaks while the users are on it? And what I read on an article was that you need to make sure that the functionality of the new micro front end works, and then you define a contract. Mm -hmm. But what is the contract? We all have bugs in production in which we say, oh, you know, I changed this, I wasn't expecting something else to break, right? So 
while each front end, each new entity, let's say, might be smaller, the connections are not. Because, I mean, just because you are not updating a component or, or a part in a release, it doesn't mean something else is not affected. Make a change to one, especially when you do a wrong slicing, and um, then you need to test all the connected multi front end workflows, right? So you have reduced the independence anyway. And then should each team verify integrations? Like, shall we have a collective uh, shared suite where there are like all the tests for that journey in terms of regression testing? Isn't this another monolith where it takes hours mm -hmm. to give a yeah. go to go to production? You know, we are just moving the problem in another place. So in theory, you can reduce the time spent for testing. But really, it means that the surface for regression testing can be much smaller. Do you think it's good? I don't think it's good. Like reducing testing surface for me is like reducing the budget for your system security in your company. Really, it's not good. Mm -hmm. So the overhead of architectural decisions can indirectly affect the quality of the whole software. And to prevent that, there will be more time spent for each new feature that is introduced across you know different teams and, and roles um i am almost done i promise this is the last part <laughs> <laughs> um in terms of code splitting and reusability you know with micro front ends um reusability is also flagged as one of the reasons why it might be a good fit for you yeah. I th that's really really dangerous it's unrealistic to think that each company has experiences where the UI can be reused across journey as is. Because various journeys have various business requirements and you will end up in a set of components with a lot of if else inside. Maybe presentational components that are wrapped around uh, uh, connected components, right? So. And every time there is a new feature added, then you need to ask your product manager like two weeks time refactoring because you want to abstract it more and more, right? So be careful on this because um, reusability is not, a, a, let's say, a silver bullet. Uh, you should follow design principles, but as well, you should understand when is the right time to adopt one. Um, as I was saying, when there is so much in common between each entity, uh, a common mistake is to start placing everything in a kind of shared project, right? Uh, and, and in that case, micro front end entities become small nucleus floating around a large portion of shared code. This is just a catch all location for. Uh, as a kind of dumping ground, if I can, if I can say it, right? So you should be really careful in, in terms of uh, reusability, which I think is also uh, a sign for overconfidence, right? Also, we talk about faster build times. So faster build times. Really, I think this is something debatable because we forget about the total time spent. It's true that you have a smaller build, and it can run faster. But for a small to medium application, it can be a premature optimization. It can, take, it, can, it can take really a long time before the builds grow so much to become slow. So micro front ends in this case can increase your total net time spent. And instead of building a simple, sorry, a single application, you now have multiple distinct builds, tests, release suite that needs to run. And then you need to check all those connections together. So I think just to sum up, I think that micro front end is a good strategy, but you need to be careful. There are just very few cases where it is a good fit. And what are those cases? So if we know all these challenges, how can we approach a different solution? How can we build a resilient front-end architecture while being able to deliver efficiently? Lesson learned is that your companies, uh, I mean, your company evolves over the time and your architecture evolves over the time too. There are good cases where micro front-ends can be adopted and uh, it is where you have uh, 
small coupling or absent coupling between the entities that you're going to divide, to split. And it works well in very large organizations. In terms of company sites and application sites, they play a key role in determining if you should not adopt the micro frontends, which in my opinion is small to mid-sized application. Like you can find better solutions. Um, especially if you have many reusable parts, let's say across journeys, then okay, you can really start thinking of adopting micro front ends. And maybe you can start engaging with your product owner to make sure that you can somehow unify, you know, all the, sorry, product owner and designers to make sure you can unify those journeys. But really, if you see that you start branching inside your components because in a, for example, for a market, a component can render like this, and for another market or in another journey, the component should render like that. Then that is not a good fit for micro front ends. That is not a good fit for reusability apart from micro front ends. Again, as I said, if if that's not the case for you, no worries. You should not feel behind anyone. Uh, many companies are using different approaches, which is monorepo strategy, for example. We are talking about Google, Facebook. I mean, I'm not announcing anything new, right? Um, if you have many interweaved domains, then you should go for something that works better. One of the solutions I've been involved to was I mean, we, we stopped using micro frontends. I'm not talking of my current company, but we start we stopped using micro frontends and we adopted the multi SPA solution. Basically, each journey had its own application, right? It was scaling well. It does not break any other team because we were owning the food journey. Design is still consistent. Testing was effective. Uh, development was at speed. This works for any company sites. You can also leverage, you know, a monolith. You can also leverage um, a monorepo. Don't forget the monorepo is not a monolith, right? Uh, but then if you're able to decouple the application from the way the code is organized, then you're already building a great solution, regardless of micro frontends, monorepo, or monolith. Well, I think that doing micro frontends with a monorepo is not ideal. But what I want to say is that it's a mistake to think that what is not micro front ends can't be well structured. So you can use a good component model. You can, again, close, uh, work closely with product managers and designers to simplify work and unify experiences, right? So maybe if you don't know about Monorepo, I encourage you to learn about Monorepo. If you know about monorepo and you think i'm crazy i would say don't ask if monorepo is good for you ask if you are good for monorepo right <laughs> we've actually um had a another question from jamie just before this slide come up um yeah. i'm not too i'm not too sure if jamie's already seen these slides but um <laughs> he's uh, he asked what do you think of nx and i noticed you you mentioned it down there um so what are your thoughts on that, Martin? Yeah, I never work I never work with an X directly, but using monorepo, I think it's a great alternative because monorepo is just a way of organizing the code in a single place, right? Uh, again, I never work with monorepo directly. I work with multi-SPA solutions. I was exploring an X. I also have seen Rush Stack, which is which seems to be a good fit, and also Yarn. I mean, they're pretty much similar. Yeah. Uh, Yarn. When I say Yarn, I mean the workspaces uh, way. Um, so it's an alternative to micro front ends because when you think about micro front ends, you should think about code base, which is split, which is divided. Like there is no centralization of the code anymore. And somehow you need to bring everything together yeah. uh, to, to make the final UI. While maybe with, with Monorepo, I'm not sure. Uh, you, you, I mean, for sure you have everything in, in a single place and then you bundle everything, I guess, at static time, but you can leverage things like dynamic imports in terms of uh, increasing performances and so on. So to answer your question, I think NX it's a good tool. I don't know if it's the best among the one that I'm just sharing. Uh, in terms of strategy, I never have been involved in working with Monorepo, but I work with 
multi SPA solutions, which means you have a journey, you have an SPA for that journey. So that SPA is responsible for the routing in that journey. It is okay in terms of scaling, it scales well. There are many centralized things in terms of, for example, routing, registering, and uh, um, also the design can be fragmented, but that's a matter of, let's say, organizational concern, right? It's a problem of the organization. You don't need to change the development strategy to improve your organization, right? So. Yeah. To go back, yes, we can scale the front end. We can build a resilient software. We don't need to change strategy to do so. And I mean, to change, to, to improve our organization. We, we need, what we can do from a development perspective is learn and adopt software engineering best practices. This is what I think is the missing part. And then where you see high chance of reusability for the couple identities, especially if you are in a large company, Micro frontends for sure is a good fit. If not, don't think that there is something wrong. You can adopt other solutions like uh, Monorepo, for example, or uh, a multi SPA solution. And uh, that's it for me. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we, we do have a few questions, Marco, so I'll crack straight on. Um, it's actually quite interesting that to understand, obviously, the, how, um, how, it seems like it's a good idea to adopt um, micro front end, but obviously there's so many factors that you need to consider, obviously, when thinking about it. Um, one question I had actually was, you mentioned about um, obviously it benefited, benefiting larger companies, obviously you're working at Amex, um, which is obviously huge. So how easy is it to get a buy-in from the sort of product owners or stakeholders, whoever it may be, to, to adopt that model? So when I joined Amex, I already found the solution in place. I joined wow. Amex uh, one year and a half ago. I think it's a long journey. Uh, I'm not talking specifically to Amex, of course. In general, I think it can be a very long journey because, as I said, you don't adopt micro front ends since the first line of code. Yeah. You adopt micro front ends over the time because you feel like, oh, that's too big. I can't handle it anymore. So really, micro front ends, you see it more when you migrate to, let's say, your software or, for example, your legacy software. How many of us have been involved in developing in an old stack uh, like Angular, jQuery? I don't know. I'm just raising points to <laughs> React, for example, right? Yeah. So, in that case, it can be slow for two reasons. First of all, your company should be mature enough to adopt that mentality, yeah. that model, right? And then, of course, you need to set the boundaries because what you want to do is being able to drive everyone and being able to empower teams to say, okay, you can take a set of decisions by yourself and we will do the rest for you. Yeah. Right? So really... It can be a long time also because when there is a software rewriting or, or, or a migration, of course, what you do in the real life is actually what the business does is getting in contact with the with designers and you rewrite the experience. So it's not just migrating, it's rewriting it because you want to change the design, you want to add new features. And as developers, what we want to do, we get excited in rewriting code because it's challenging for us, right? So it might take really a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cool. Um, got a few questions here, Marco. I think we covered these um, maybe throughout the talk, um, but uh, one of the questions was, how do you envision legacy code in the context of building resilient software? Okay, so um, legacy code as well as monoliths might sound like bad words, but don't forget that legacy code works it does its job. And uh, so legacy code for me is something that can be a source of revenue. Otherwise you just delete it, right? Legacy code is called such because even if it works, it might be written in a different way. Yeah. And imagine for example, uh, yourself as a developer, right? And um, you move around your, your large organization in various teams and every time you see something that you did not write, for example, you don't understand it and you think, oh, this is legacy. I'm going to rewrite it in a better way. But what is better? 
How do you measure it? Like refactoring is not a civil bullet. So it's just a temporary solution. You're just deferring a problem. What I mean with this is I see resilient software as uh, the one that can, where technical depths don't take many weeks of refactoring. And if there is any technical depth, they can be easily removed. We always have recurring technical depths, right? And this is what you want to avoid when you build a resilient software. Technical depths comes because of new APIs in our framework. So because we, uh, we have, I don't know, uh, security problem, you know, there are many reasons. So legacy code and resilient software can be, I mean, you can transform your, your legacy code in resilient software in, um, by having a good understanding of the context, by having a good long-term vision for the product, not just throwing uh, lines of work yeah. code, right? And remember, the real cost of software development is the maintenance over the time, not the cost to build it. And if you're working with legacy code, it means that maybe that code was already resilient. You, you can do it better, right? So business requests change, new features come in, the software continuously evolves. It's a kind of infinite game. Yeah, cool. Um... But Marco, I think that's all we've got time for, um, unfortunately. Um, but again, yeah, very interesting. It was great to get a better insight into micro front ends, what they are, are they worth it, when they're worth it. Um, and yeah, it was really nice to have you back on. Um, and hopefully we can do it for a third time, maybe in person. Yeah, old school. <laughs> yeah, old school, exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, this event has been recorded and we'll be uploading it to YouTube shortly. Um, plus we'll be sharing uh, sort of presentation relevant information on our August blog in case you missed anything. So uh, keep an eye on that. Next week, uh, we've got a really exciting event. Uh, JVM was it's called. So we've got uh, four speakers um, fighting the corner of their chosen language so we've got java scala closure and kotlin so that's going to be really fun uh, marco you got involved in a front end one similar earlier this year battle of the frameworks um we you yeah. fighting for react i think um that, and that was really cool so we're looking forward to uh, to next next wednesday 6 p.m i think um london or english time so um yeah thanks again everyone for joining us uh, special thanks again to marco um stay safe everyone and thanks for joining us. Cheers, Marco. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers.